Okay, I'm uh, Len Augsburger, the uh, project coordinator for the Newman Numismatic Portal at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, we have today with us also uh, Shannon Davis, who is the manager of digital library services uh, within Olin Library at Washington University, and also uh, Nicole Fry, who manages the uh, scanning center um, in St. Louis at, at WashU. All right, so this project was uh, officially launched at the end of uh, 2014 uh, via a grant from the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society, uh, informally known as EPNIS, uh, made a grant to uh, Washington University for uh, funding the Newman portal for the first four years. Uh, the portal itself is administered through the university. Uh, myself and uh, Shannon and Nicole are all uh, employees of the university within the library. And the charter uh, is uh, literature and images uh, of American numismatics, but we have uh, expanded into uh, a lot of uh, foreign and ancient content. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, so we began scanning uh, at uh, ANS uh, in November 2015. Um, this is administered by uh, Internet Archive under the funding of uh, the Newman Portal. We have dedicated space at the ANS uh, set up behind us here. Uh, some of you saw it uh, during the break. Uh, the scanner set up there. And uh, David Hill, uh, the librarian here, uh, manages the flow of material into and out of uh, the scanning room. And then We've had two scanners here. Uh, John Grafeo from Internet Archive uh, was here for about a couple of years. Uh, he's moved on to uh, Denver, where he's going to be actually doing some other work for Newman Portal on a subcontract basis. And then now we have uh, Laura Jacobs is now uh, on site here at the ANS doing the, the physical scanning. So uh, by way of background on uh, Internet Archive, which is the main repository for all of this material. Uh, this is a, a nonprofit library uh, founded by uh, Brewster Kale, who is uh, a tech entrepreneur out on the West Coast. Um, their charter is universal, universal access to all knowledge. Uh, they're among the top 300 websites uh, in the world. They originally began as the Wayback Machine, which was an effort to archive the internet itself. And what they do is go out and periodi periodically take snapshots of different websites. Uh, they're on the road towards having a trillion pages archived. Um, this was a resource that was very frequently consulted uh, in the last election cycle. People want to know who said what and when they said it. A lot of that information is on the Internet Archive Wayback Machine. Uh, so in addition to web pages, uh, a few years ago they began scanning books actively. They've done over uh, 10 million texts now. Uh, they have multiple redundant digital copies of the archive itself at, at different locations. Uh, and uh, after the last election, they decided it would be good to have one of those locations outside of the United States. So there's now a copy of uh, Internet Archive Repository in Canada. Um, in addition to uh, scanning material themselves, they have uh, several hundred partners, uh, which Washington University is one. And uh, these partners can do their own scanning in their own specialty areas. and. Uh, get that material on the Internet Archive that way. Uh, Google Books, Hottie Trust, and others, uh, you know, some time ago uh, backed up a truck to, you know, Harvard, University of Michigan, several other large university libraries. Um, and that created a huge number of scanned books on the order of uh, 20 million. Um, but those libraries don't have niche collections of numismatics or other specialties. So that's where these partner programs come in. Um, Internet Archive has uh, satellite centers throughout the country, of which uh, ANS is one. And uh, Newman Portal uses I as, as our document repository. So uh, to get a better visual representation of how all this works. Um, so we've got different entities here. Um, Newman Portal, Internet Archive, ANS, and, and this is kind of how it all fits together. 
we have scanning happening at uh, Washington University, scanning happening here at ANS. There is some additional scanning done at the IA Center in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, they, the, the, the Virgil Brand ledgers uh, from the ANS library, uh, because they were oversized, were scanned there. Uh, Princeton is also scanning CoinWorld, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. And then we also get uh, electronic acquisitions from partners that have already scanned their material. Um, and all of this goes into Internet Archive. Um, and the way this is designed, if Newman Portal goes away tomorrow, and it's not, but if it did, you would still have this entire uh, repository available on, on, on Internet Archive. And someone else could come along and you know, start their own numismatic information website and uh, draw in all that material. So that's on Internet Archive. And then uh, Internet Archive feeds a couple different things. Uh, one, they feed uh, Newman Portal. So we draw all our information from there. And then the other connection we have is that the ANS library catalog, Donum, uh, points to all of these resources on Internet Archive. So we've scanned about 4,500 documents here out of the library. And if you go into Donum and look at those uh, particular records for those documents, there will be a link to Internet Archive, and then you can actually look at the physical copy of uh, the document. All right, so Newman Portal uh, is getting all its scanned information from Internet Archive. Uh, we also have a few other uh, databases internal to the portal. Uh, most recently, we've added one for images. And then we have some other uh, value-added services that are not on Internet Archive, most important of which is search. So uh, everything uh, on Newman Portal um, is, is text searchable. All right, so in terms of the scanning equipment here, uh, we had uh, John Grafeo was manning the scanner for uh, a couple years, and uh, we're doing uh, regular format, regular size documents here, and then some of the oversized material has been uh, lent out to uh, Princeton, uh, which, which David show, showed us a minute ago. All right, so in terms of the scan and queue here, we've got this huge library, so you know, how did we decide what to go after first? Um, as I noticed, uh, as I pointed out, our, our initial charter was uh, documents and images related to American numismatics. We have taken uh, a lot of world and ancient content. Uh, we have uh, Harlan Burke, uh, let us scan all of his auction catalogs. We've got a couple hundred on there. Uh, there's different societies that have approached us and said, you know, will you scan our stuff? And we're always happy to do that. So we've had about 50 different institutional and uh, society partners. So the Lithuanian Numismatic Association has had a journal for many years. The Armenian Numismatic Society has had a journal for uh, about 50 years, and uh, we've been happy to take all of those and scan them, and, and those are on uh, Newman Portal now at, at no cost to the organization. Within what we scan, we do try and take uh, coherent and complete groups. So if we're doing, for example, stacks auction catalogs, we want to do all of them. So today we have 800 auction catalogs from Stacks on Newman Portal. So if you have a pile of them in your basement, you can get rid of them. Um, and then uh, within uh, the ANS collection, what we focused on are, are the American numismatic auction catalogs uh, using uh, John Adams' bibliography as a guide. Uh, we also get uh, material loaned from uh, the Dan Hamelberg Library in Champaign, which we scan in St. Louis. And then we have done some of the archival uh, groups here as well. Virgil Brand ledgers are now accessible online. The New Netherlands uh, firm records are on there. A lot of bid books from uh, their, their auctions are on there. Very helpful for pedigree research. And then the Garrett family papers, correspondence, inventories, uh, all on there as well. How, how do you ensure that that you have a system in place to make sure that new catalogs continue to get added? Right, so typically while we're doing that, for example, so for Stacks, for example, they have their uh, new catalogs are put on the web. 
so we periodically go grab you know the last last few catalogs and we can get that way um, a lot of the scanning we've done are for firms that are no longer extant yeah, but so I mean, firms that extent I mean there was I mean just a like they used to have stuff that they had online has disappeared over time. Yes. So <laughs> and the biggest, I mean, that yep. difficulty in sort of keeping that pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. And we fully expect that some of the things we scan and put online mm -hmm. will disappear from dealer websites over time mm -hmm. because they change IT vendors or there's some discontinu discontinuity in the firm management and yeah. the stuff just disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm using the you know, new portals. Absolutely fantastic. But uh, I think the, the major leap here is, is that you can uh, do this kind of free text search of, of the catalog. But uh, what I end up doing with that, with, with the text, is um, putting it into a structured format where each auction listing has a has a grade, a, a date, a description, mm -hmm. something like that. And then I have to somehow find the the auction, um, the, uh, the sale prices, and then link link it to that. Do you have any plans to automate? To automate that process. Right. So I think what you're wanting to see is every single auction lot as its own entity yeah. and, and searchable as such. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's a big question. And there's there's different aggregators out there. PCGS CoinFAX is you know very big. Mm -hmm. um, what we have on our site is uh, under the encyclopedia. Uh, we have uh, the data that is accessible from the CDN exchange. And there are a couple hundred, about a couple million auction lots listed in there, uh, where if you're looking at you know, 1926 Lincoln cents, you can drill down to uh, only for U.S. coins. Yeah, okay. that date and issue, and look at the auction prices realized for that particular issue. Mm. Now, I think maybe one other thing you want to do is export all that to a spreadsheet. Um, mm. sure. Yeah, <laughs> that, that that we don't have. <laughs> so, but you can get to. Um, you can drill down to uh, individual U.S. issues. Okay, so this is uh, the first document that came off uh, the scanners at A&S, uh, bound volume of uh, Edward Kogan auction sales. Uh, within the rare book room, there's a series of uh, bound volumes of early American auction sales, and we work through that systematically. Again, we're trying to go after complete groups rather than pick one here and, and pick one there. Um, and then in this series, there, there are 70 auction sales, and uh, all of those are uh, accessible via Newman Portal. All right, so at the a and uh, we're up to uh, 4,500 documents. Um, and uh, we've used uh, John Adams' uh, U.S. Numis numismatic literature as a guide. Our coverage, Volume 1, uh, is 97% of those catalogs listed, and, and Volume 2 in, in 93%. Um, so we're really at the point where we can look at this and say, okay, I've done 4,500 documents out of uh, the entire ANS library, it's about 150,000 items. So I've done 3% of the library. And that's just one scanner working for a couple of years on, on one machine. So you can sort of scale this to what would it take to scan the entire ANS library? Um, and it's surprisingly not that big of a number. So. Um, you know, this conceivably could happen. Um, all right, and then uh, within the ANS, we're moving on to uh, some of the next tier American auction catalogs. Um, we also want to systematically work through uh, Sotheby's, Glenn Dinnings. Uh, a lot of those early catalogs have uh, some good American content. Why the focus on American? Is it because you can get funding for it? Uh, the, uh, the charter. Uh, you know, originally, you know, sort of followed what Eric Newman was doing in terms of his own scholarship. Um, but I think th the family is very open to us and getting involved in other Islamic areas. Islamic collector, <laughs> maybe when, when, when you say something like Glenn Dennings, you're talking about almost 3,000 au auction catalogs uh, over a 80-year period, uh, and there, there's maybe one tenth of one percent of it is U.S. coinage. Yeah, and that's that's okay. So um, we'll cover everything in a Glenn sale. Sure. Yeah, we're not we're not going to go into catalog and scan one page. We'll do you know if we're there, we're going to scan all of it. Yeah, because you know, Glenn, Glenn Dennings is a daunting task. Yeah. Yeah, but one that's 
that's, that's one of the most daunting tasks out there. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, with stacks between coin galleries and stacks, you know, it's a thousand catalogs. We've done that, it. That so. it's stacks and stacks and <laughs> stacks. No offense to stacks, but they're nothing compared to yeah. what, what's been in Glen since the 1800s. Right. So. So, but you know we you know we have the capacity and you know we yeah. can do that. So it's not that many pages, though. Well, they're very unfortunately very few photos. No, they were Glenn, the Glenn, two. Glenn Dinnings was a you showed up, you looked. No, but Glenn Dinnings had the non-photo and the photo version for each catalog. Yeah, not of every catalog though. They're Almost. Well, we looked at it, but I mean. Yeah. There's an anus is a very good representation, which was one of the photo catalogs. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, one thing uh, we've been able to do is uh, with the Donum catalog. Uh, if you look at a, a catalog reference for a Chapman Brothers Bushnell sale from 1882, uh, you'll see a link to the online resources, and there will be a link there to uh, the copy on the Internet Archive. Now, often uh, within the ANS collection, there may be multiple copies of some of these early sales. A lot of them have uh, unique annotations or mm -hmm. uh, some handwritten prices realized. Uh, and what you'll see in that case is there will be multiple links here to copy one, copy two, and, and, and so on. All right, so this is uh, just what uh, one of the Chapman catalogs looks like that's been scanned. Um, this particular catalog was uh, used by uh, John Danroyther, John Kralievich for uh, an article in a recent ANS magazine uh, related to some of the uh, J.P. Morgan coins. And uh, you know they were able to just sit at home and look at this rather than having to call David or, or coming to New York to look at stuff. All right, Coin World. So we our scan and coin world. It's being done at uh, the Internet Archive Satellite Center in Princeton. Uh, the physical copy was loaned to us by Coin World, uh, and which is actually Eric Newman's original. Uh, yes, it was donated to them by Eric Newman, as, as it turns out. Um, so the uh, the IA Satellite Center uh, is at the physically situated at the Princeton University Library. Um, there are about 3,000 issues. It's been a weekly for about 60 years. We've done about 600 of them so far. They're currently um, in a restricted collection on, on Internet Archives. You cannot see them, but the, the scans have, have physically been done. Um, we are still working with Amos Media to figure out exactly what the level of access to this material is going to be. Um, some of it will be completely open. Some of it will be uh, search only. Uh, in the case of uh, search only, uh, you could make a, a further inquiry to, uh, you know, David Hill at ANS Library to go copy an article, or you know, come in yourself and look at it. Um, so, a lot of issues surrounding, you know, does Amos Media want to potentially digitize some of this content, um, or is it something that they're willing to open up? Um, so those discussions continue, um, but there was no reason not to go ahead and do this work. And uh, we had uh, an AS, ANS board members generously donating half of the cost to do this, and then uh, Newman Portals picking up the other half. So this is something that's been needed to be done uh, for a long time, and uh, we'd like to do the same thing with uh, Numismatic News. Um, so discussions with uh, F and W Media, their current owner, uh, haven't as progressed as much as we'd like, but that's that's on our, our radar screen as well too. Okay, so this is what sixty years of Coin World looks like. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> they've uh, plowed through about twenty percent of this already, so it is happening, um, and uh, you know within a few months uh, we'll uh, have all of that done. And at a minimum, it'll be uh, available. Uh, for uh, search only uh, research on Newman Portal. Have you reached the point where it's online and secure enough that the physical copy becomes redundant? Yeah, and this, this is a question that libraries everywhere are asking themselves. Um, and I, I think. Yeah, I, ultimately, you, you have to have a physical copy somewhere, just as a matter of good practice. Yeah, but you can, permanent storage is the, 
And this is one of the reasons why the ANS is very interested because um, just to give you an idea, I calculated the, the footprint, you know, just what's in the library with the number of users. Um, just the library alone, um, the least cost is, you could probably translate to $300,000 because of a year of what sits there. So that's a lot of <coughs> money if you could reduce this. And it's not that people would actually prefer to do that individually. So, um, but I, I'll say a little bit more yeah, the it, savings there. Right. Uh, people like dealing with physical artifacts. There's just something about having a, a printed book that uh, enlivens your research. So I think at some level we, we have to keep making this stuff accessible. Um, but at the same time, you've got the advantages of the computer that are so great um, that you're really compelled to uh, engage with that as well. But then you've got to reshell the damn thing. Uh, yeah. So do you, do you ever make use of um, microfilm to help with this? Yeah. So. Uh, and this is very germane because we just had a networking event a couple weeks ago and one of our St. Louis uh, colleagues said, oh, I have a microfilm scanner. And I'm like, oh, I could make use of that. Um, but yeah, because um, National Archives in the 50s and 60s uh, digitized a lot of the stuff related to uh, U.S. Mint. So those microfilms are out there. We have access to some of those. Um, so we have not scanned microfilm yet, but we definitely expect to. Um, and this first batch of material is about 6,000 images, so, um, you know, it's pretty substantial. Would you be working in the National Archives at all? Absolutely. Um, and we've gotten, uh, Bob Julian donated to us about uh, 40,000 images uh, that he had done under sponsorship of Central States Numismatic Society, so those are in there. We are actively subcontracting uh, Roger Burdett. Uh, he's given us uh, a lot of material as well. Uh, so. And we've got a couple other subcontractors that are going to be working in Philadelphia and also Denver. Denver I'm excited about because a lot of researchers have, have already been to uh, National Archives in Washington, uh, Philadelphia, College Park, but the ones out west haven't been explored as much. Um, so we'll, we'll be getting stuff out of uh, Denver as well. Uh, but I, I, National Archives I love because um, people haven't been able to access it. Cause it's really hard to get to. You have to fly there during normal business hours and you know wait for the stuff to be called and it, it's difficult to work with. Um, so we can take that away um, and, and, and make that accessible. Um, and of course the other nice thing about it is it's all uh, public domain. So um, a lot of numismatic, more recent numismatic material we can't scan because it is in copyright. A copyright owner doesn't you know, want it to go open access. Um, so National Archives doesn't have that issue. Um, and uh, you know, we're just going to keep building that collection. Um, and their, their material is endless, so we do have to be kind of careful about what we do and not just go in there and take random things. But there are a lot of uh, worthy groups doing, like you know, U.S. Mint Director's Correspondence. You know, that's like one record group in National Archives, so it's worth doing all of that. So we're, we'll, yeah, we'll definitely keep uh, getting stuff out of uh, U.S. National Archives. Um, the other area we work with pretty closely is uh, U.S. government publications. Again, all public domain, so very attractive that way. Uh, Washington University is a member of the uh, Federal Depository Library Program, which was, it's a consortium of about a thousand libraries with the charter of opening up access to U.S. government documents. Much more important in previous years before the internet, um, but still an important repository of these documents. So we are combing through that collection for numismatic material. The congressional proceedings, for example, have a lot of related legislation uh, and, and congressional reports and, and documents and so forth. So we're, we're getting all that out of there. Um, and then there are these other different series like annual reports of the Director of the Mint or the Secretary of the Treasury or the Office of the you know, Comptroller of the Currency. Uh, so a lot of really nice series in there that, that we've been able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Would you ever consider going to another country to scan a collection abroad? Absolutely. Um, I exchanged uh, a few emails with Ted Buttry a few <laughs> months ago. Um, they're, uh, 
not necessarily really set up for an operation like this. But if uh, you know the right opportunities out there, yeah, definitely. Because it for example, there are lots of archives in, in Central America, and like Guatemala City and mm -hmm. Honduras and stuff. These kind of decaying 18th century libraries, yeah. just filled with lots of references actually to U.S. coinage. Right. Because um, they they used it over there. They had this whole plethora of different uh, different currencies. And Kind of yeah, and um, you know, if there's like an institution and uh, an in internet archive satellite center, you know, reasonably close, we can <laughs> maybe not there, but you know, perhaps somewhere else. But you know, we could we could make that happen. So it's definitely something we're open to. Um, you know, it, it, it especially you know, archival and manuscript and non-published information is very attractive because there's no access to, to it to to it any other way. Yeah, it's quite hard to access. Yeah.